Chapter 51 Now What? Making my way through the battlefield, I slowly made my way to where Jane and Julius were looking over the battlefield, in amazement of our achievement just like I had done. Stepping over the corpses, I made sure not to accidentally step on the bodies of the newly deceased. Finally reaching them, I stopped and looked out at the field of bodies. T have seen many wars and battles fought, but this was my first time taking part in one, I said. T don't think it's for me, Julius said in almost a whisper. Did you see the kids? Jane asked us. I turned to look at her. T thinks so, maybe a couple. I didn't think about it, I just kept swinging my sword at anything in front of me. I wish I could say the same, but I had to think and see to use my powers, Julius said. When I had to tear them apart, or when I bashed them together, I had to watch, he said. Turning to him I spoke. Well, they weren't really there anymore, so don't feel bad. I said to him. What do you mean? They weren't really there. Jane asked. Children who have been turned are more impulsive and less capable of self-control compared to adult vampires and are even more vulnerable to their vampiric instincts. Their thirst for blood is all that drives them forward, like a person dying of thirst in the desert. All they can think about is the liquid that could sedate their thirst, which for them is blood. I said, we went quite again, just sitting there looking out at the destruction we had caused and thinking about the fight. Jane's head turned and looked out to our side. You did it, Jane said, as she saw the burning bodies of Stefan and Alec. He nodded my head. Yes, he's gone. She sat there dead still for a moment, watching the burning flames before speaking again. Thank you, she said in a sad tone. I looked at her. There's no need to thank me, he didn't deserve what he got, but at least now he can be at peace. Jane slowly nodded her head, and we all went quiet again. After a few moments, Julia spoke. What now? he asked, breaking the silence that surrounded us. A wicked smile spread across my face. Now, I'm going to go talk to the Volturi, then we are going to go see all those things I told you about. Both Jane's and Julius's heads shot in my direction. Really? Jane said excitedly, dispersing the shroud of sadness that once surrounded her. Really? Now while I'm gone, why don't the two of you decide where you want to go first? I said with a chuckle, as I turned to start heading up the hill I had last seen the Volturi standing on. Stepping over bodies and body parts, I finally made it to the top of the hill, where I saw the last few remaining vampires milling about around a large tent that was recently put up, while in the distance, I could see the last surviving human blood bags, being guarded by just one vampire. Reaching the tent, I swung open the tent flap and stepped inside. The inside of the tent was dark, with very little amounts of light creeping through the fabric tent. Inside sat the three Volturi heads, all sitting around a circle wooden table and in ornate chairs. Behind them stood two of their personal guards, who gave me death stares as I stepped in. Instantly saw the tightening around Ara's eyes and the tension in Marcus and Caius' bodies at my appearance. They are still tensed up after my little reminder I gave them, I thought with a chuckle. Thonisly can't blame them, one minute they were kings, the next I was tearing them apart, breaking the illusion they had of them being invincible. Aro was the first to speak. Ah, if it isn't the savior of the battle, he said, with a hint of a sneer hidden under his complimenting words. Yes, it's me, and you're welcome. I said with a chuckle at his words. Tim just stopping by to tell you this is where we separate, and I and my coven members go our own way, I said, and also where I bring you another warning. I added. Aro raised an eyebrow. And that would be, he asked. I stepped forward until I was standing rig, shti in front of the round table they were seated at, and looked Aro dead in the eyes. To will stay out of your way as long as you stay out of mine. You can do as you wish with the vampiric world as long as you stay away from my coven and myself. And if you decide that it is a good idea to come for me and my coven, I won't give you a warning, and I won't hold back like I did to you. I will come for you and I will kill all of you, I said in almost a whisper. I saw a flash of fear and anger run through Aras's eyes before he slowly nodded his head. I saw that Caius wanted to open his mouth and say something, but my eyes flashed in his direction and I stared him in the eyes, giving him a warning with my cold glare. When they didn't say anything, I turned on my heels and started for the exit, 
not giving them time to say anything that might piss me off. Stepping out of the tent, I let my eyes adjust to the light before going to grab our packs, then head back to Jane and Julius. Now laden down with all our packs, I slowly made my way back to Jane and Julius, who were now sitting on the hilltop and still looking over the battlefield. Have you figured out where the both of you would like to go first? I asked them, as I reached where they were seated. Julius turned his head and looked at me. Yes, we have, he said, in a happy tone. Dropping their packs on the damp ground, I asked. And where would that be? With a smile on his face, he said, To the east, to the other ocean, Julius said. Really? I said in surprise. Yes, I always wanted to go, Julius said. Those stories you told us sounded very interesting, and we would love to see the culture there. Jane added. He nodded my head. Sure, we can take the Silk Road straight there, I said as I thought of the best path to take. Looking back at the battlefield, Julius asked. What is going to happen to all the bodies? I thought for a moment before saying, more than likely they are just going to burn all of them, I said with a shrug. Jane looked up at me. Won't they try to put them back together? She asked. Possibly, but there are so many broken limbs and body parts down there, it would be almost impossible to find which part goes to who. The Volturi will more than likely just start over again, but maybe with fewer vampires, it's not like they really have any enemies left. Except you, Julius added. Except me, I chuckled. We have a bit of an understanding. They keep the vampires under control and I don't wipe out their race. I said with a huff. Jane looked up at me again. You would take out the vampire race? She asked. I let out a laugh. Maybe if they get out of hand, sure. The only reason I haven't is because most vampires are just trying to survive, like the rest of us, and they aren't insane sycophantic a-holes like the Romanian coven was, who kill for fun, but instead kill to survive. She nodded her head at that. Now I don't know about the both of you, but I'm ready to get going. The less time we spend around the Volturi, the better. I said, picking up my pack and putting it on my back. Jane and Julius soon followed my lead and grabbed their own packs. Once we were set and ready to go, I stopped and looked out at the field of dead bodies one last time. As I looked out at the field, the clouds for the first time in almost two weeks opened, and a ray of sunlight shone through and onto the battlefield, causing the broken limbs and bodies of the dead vampires to sparkle brightly. It's strange, Julius said from beside me. Looking over at him, I asked, What is? I gestured with his chin at the now sparkling field, how something that only moments ago was a scene of death, destruction, and carnage can now look so magical. Meant to post sooner, but the power went out because of the weather, and I wasn't able to access my computer, so sorry about that. If there are any problems, please let me know. Chapter 52 East The trip to the east and into Asia was a long journey. With our constant stops at anything we found interesting, or if we just felt like relaxing for a few days, it's not like we had anywhere to be at the moment. We decided to go by land instead of sea, so we could see the world around us instead of the constant blue of the sea. The experience was incredible for both Jane and Julius alike. Julius might be 600 years old, but all he has ever seen was Rome, Alexandria, and our home in England. But other than that, he was a clean slate, as well as Jane. On our travels east, we stopped at some of the most important places. First at Constantinople. Then we stopped and saw the massive walls of Babylon. Then continued east, going from city to city. Along the way, I picked up my old habit of trading. And before you knew it, we had a camel, who Jane named Joshua, who carried some silks and herbs, and a donkey, who was truly an ass. The thing would bite anyone who got close to it. We didn't even bother to name him, Jane and Julius had a bet going to see how long it would take before I killed him myself. Cough. Moving on. With my new fire burning inside me, we continued on our journey east. Town to town, or city to city, we went, without a care in the world, just enjoying our lives to the fullest. While we were on our travels, I came across a first for me in this world. A Bible. The Bible was written in Hebrew, so I had a little trouble reading it. Hebrew not being one of my main languages of speaking, so I had become rather rusty at it. But as I continued to read it, the more it came back to me, and the more I understood of the book. As I read, I came across the story of Adam and Eve. 
Reading the story, I wasn't surprised at what happened, from when they ate the apple from the tree of knowledge to being kicked out of the Garden of Eden, as well as what God did when he kicked them out of Eden. But what differed from the original Bible was the discrimination of Adam himself. In the original Bible, there wasn't much of a discrimination of either Adam or Eve. Instead, the story mostly focuses on the creation of human beings and their relationship with God. The appearance of Adam is not mentioned in detail in the biblical account, but in this Bible, there was an actual detailed description of him. Tall, pale skin, and hair like snow. Oh fuck, I thought as I read the first few words of the description. You have got to be kidding me. I said to myself, as I sat beside a small fire, in the middle of a desert, in what will become Afghanistan. At the moment, both Jane and Julius were off hunting for any wildlife there might be in the desolate mountains, leaving me to sit and tend the fire. Which I didn't mind because it gave me time to read. But now, I am a little afraid. This can't be real, can it, me, a part of what will be the biggest religion in the world, as the first human. Pushing down the wild thoughts that erupted at even the thought of that being true, I continued to read. The story continued after the banishment of Adam and Eve, like normal. Toil of work for Adam and birth to hurt for Eve. But what really changed things was that the story continued to Adam and Eve's first two sons, Cain and Abel, and where Cain kills Abel in a fit of jealousy. But in this Bible, Adam witnessed Abel's death, and in a rage, Adam killed his other son, Cain. When God witnessed this act of anger, he cursed Adam to become a wanderer of earth to never die. After that, the story continued. It went on to tell the story of how after the death of Eve and more of his children, Adam left to wander the world to become known as the white-haired wanderer. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck, I thought, as my brain came to a sudden halt. Fuck, fuck, fuck. I'm the Adam. I mentally panicked. My brain was turning with different emotions and thoughts as I stood and started walking around the fire in circles as I sorted out my thoughts. What could the repercussions from this be, I thought. It can't be much, right? Or another hour of my mind slowly taking itself apart, I finally managed to calm down. It's not that big of a deal. I'm sure people won't be on the hunt for me or something. After that night, I continued to read the Bible and saw that all that changed was Adam being cursed to wander the world instead of his son Cain. Continuing east, we finally made it to China. At the moment, China is going through a golden period of stability, economically, in trade, under the Tang Dynasty. We stayed in China for a little over seven months, where we traded and sold many of my goods for Chinese silks and other items. While Julius and Jane experienced the culture. Once we decided to leave, we headed north to see the Great Wall, which for its time, or even in the future, is one hell of a work of engineering. For thousands of miles, they built a wall to protect them. Now that we were leaving, we took a bit of a roundabout way back east. First going north, we did some trading with the nomadic tribes, north of China, with some of the groups that would someday become Genghis Khan's army. Even though the Mongolians weren't at their peak yet, and were still separate nomadic tribes, they were still some very incredible hunters, horse riders, and bow users. Our first meeting with the first of the nomadic tribes was a little rocky, since I didn't know their language that well. But through hand gestures and pointing, they figured out I was here to trade. They were interested in Joshua, our camel. Never before had they seen one. When I tried showing them how to ride one, it turned into a true fiasco, where there wasn't a single person there that could contain their laughter. To get onto the camel, Joshua had to lay down, so we could pull ourselves into the makeshift saddle I had bought to ride Joshua during our travels. The funny part came when the person that was seated on Joshua's back would freak out and fall off when Joshua stood up. The movement and height always caused whomever was trying to ride him to panic and either jump off or fall off his back. Thankfully, Joshua was like a big puppy and had fun watching people fall off of him. After we were done trading with that tribe of nomads, they brought us to another nomadic tribe where we once again traded goods and where the tribe's men would try and ride Joshua, but nobody could manage it. For another few months, we continued going from tribe to tribe selling and trading. On one of my trades, I managed to get my hands on one of their bows. At the moment, 
the bow wasn't like what it will become, which was a short bow that has incredible power, but you could certainly see that it was on its way to become the incredible weapon it will become. Actually found shooting the bow to be quite fun. Of course I had to be careful when using it, because with my strength, pulling the bow, which only had a 100 pound pull weight, was for me like pulling a bungee cord, and I could accidentally pull back too hard and break the bow in half. Put it was always a small rush when I hit a bullseye shot at a good distance. Leaving the nomadic tribes, we started going back west, where we stopped in India. Just like in China, India was currently going through a period of prosperity, even though it was currently split into two kingdoms, Rashtrakuta dynasty, Pratihara dynasty. The whole region was still having a large growth in their economy and other areas like mathematics and science. For almost a year, we stayed in India. We didn't mean to, but there truly were some incredible cultural things to see there, where every day we could find something new to explore. There will be time skips, but they won't be big skips. Maybe a hundred years in some at most, but I'm not big on the whole time skip scene, so I'm not going to do big ones, because the MC is going to actually start taking part in some historical events. If you have enjoyed my story, please let me know what you think. And thank you so much for the support. It does mean a lot to me. And thank you. Bean, word 1543. Chapter 53. I didn't do it. 916 AD, 4916 years in the world. To move the plot forward and get to a particular historical point, this chapter will contain a few quick time jumps. Now perched on a wooden stool, I was painting the breathtaking scenery in front of me with a paintbrush. Right now, I was painting a gorgeous dawn over a mountain crest while sitting in a forest in the Italian Alps. I dipped my brush into my homemade paint and started painting the canvas. As I painted, I couldn't help but let out a chuckle as I thought, Leonardo da Vinci, who? After returning from our almost decade-long journey to wherever we felt like going, we returned to England. But the reason I am currently sitting atop a mountain is that during our return home, Jane and Julius had finally become a couple, and let's just say, living in the same house as them wasn't the best choice at the moment. So deciding to give them time to get all of their pent-up love out of the way, I decided to start working on a new passion of mine. Painting. I got the idea after selling all of the items I had accumulated over our journeys that we didn't want to keep, including our cart that the ass who shall not be named used to pull. The person I sold the cart to was a painter of great skill. This surprised me, because the dude could really paint, I didn't remember his name ever being known in the future, or ever seeing one of his works of art, which must mean he was one of the many lost to time, as just another painter to never be known. After seeing the masterpieces in his shop, I decided to give it a shot. With my better-than-normal noggin on my shoulders, I became quite skilled at it, within a quick amount of time, turning what was meant to be something I could do to pass the time for a while, as Jane and Julius finished their, uh, business, into something I genuinely enjoyed and spent a number of years doing. I started going all over Rome and Italy itself, painting anything and everything I wished, spending a few years just dedicating myself to it. At the moment, I was playing a game of Nefadafel with King Knut. As to why or how, I'm currently in the presence of a king and playing a board game with a king. Well, for the first time in a while, I decided to actually take part in my bank's business. King Knut was the ruler of parts of Normandy and half of England, and at the moment his kingdom is in a bit of a pinch. The raids from Vikings have drawn significantly from his treasuries, with him having to pay more soldiers than needed and also employing mercenaries to patrol their costs. And so, he asked our bank for a loan, and of course, we said, sure. So with me back in England, and not doing anything, I decided why not, and met him in person to straighten out the details of the loan. And through the making of a deal, the two of us actually become friends. King Snut was actually a very interesting person. He was smart, just, and looked out for the people under his rule. Most of the time we just played board games or talked about his lands and ways he could better help his citizens. To him, I was an heir of a chain of banks that spanned different countries. And well, 
Just like any king would do, he asked me if I wished to be a duke of his kingdom. But I passed on the offer. The idea of being held down in one place just didn't sit right with me, being tied down where I would have responsibilities and be forced to stay and take care of my lands was something I tried to avoid. King Snut moved one of his pieces on the board, leaving himself open for defeat. Leaning forward in my chair, I moved one of my own pieces, taking out one of his and putting him at a loss. You always win. When will you ever let me win? King Nut said playfully. When you are skilled enough to beat me. I responded jokingly. King Nut scoffed and took a sip from a goblet of wine. T will be having dinner with my wife Emma this evening. Would you like to join us? He asked me. I shook my head. As pleasant as that sounds, I must be off, I said standing from my chair. Of course, Nut said standing from his own chair to see me off. Leaving for home, I looked up at the cloudy sky and let out a small sigh. It looks like it will rain again. I thought, as my horse was brought to me by one of the servants. Making it home two hours later, I managed to beat the rain by mere minutes. Taking my horse to the stable, I took off the saddle and fed him before entering my cozy home. Stepping through the door, I saw Julius sitting in his reclining chair, reading a very familiar book. Looking up at seeing me enter, Julius snapped the book closed and looked up at me. Raising my hands, I said, T had nothing to do with it. Lifting the book, Adam spoke. Oh, you mean the fact that you are in a religious book as the first human? I shrugged. What can I say? I didn't tell them to add me to their religion. They just did. I said with a shrug. But is it possible that you are the first human? Julius asked. I tilted my head. What do you mean? That you are the first human. You said you don't remember anything when you first woke up all those years ago. Is it possible you are the first human? Julius asked with a serious expression on his face. Oh, for fuck's sake, I thought. No, I'm not the first human, Julius. Whoever wrote it probably heard about me and added me to the book. I don't know if you remember, but I was quite the legend back in the day, and the heck they even put the name everyone gave me Pack then into the book. I said. You mean the white-haired wanderer? Julius asked. Yes, and plus it said God gave Adam a mark of immortality. Have you seen anything on me? I asked Julius. Julius furrowed his brow. No, but it's not like you walk around nude that often. Julius, I don't have any markings on me, I said with a huff. Julius shrugged, then with an evil smirk asked. So how does it feel to be a part of one of the biggest religions in existence? To let out a long sigh as I took off my cloak to hang it by the door. It feels like one massive annoyance, that's what it feels like. It could be worse, people could be praying to you. Julius said with a chuckle. Don't say that, you are going to give me a migraine. Julius let out another chuckle. Looking around the room, I asked Julius. Where is Jane? Julius looked up from the Bible he had reopened to continue reading. She's in the basement, reading your old journals. She can read those? I wrote those in Phoenician. How can she read them? I asked. You did, but you also wrote a translation key in Latin, which she can read, he said. She has been learning from it, so she can read your older journals, he said, going back to reading the Bible. Shrugging my shoulders, I leaned back in my chair and relaxed into the soft leather. In a dark cell. In a dark cell, deep under the ground, where no light shone, the sound of someone murmuring couldn't be heard, bouncing off the walls of the cell and echoing down the dark and wet corridors of the underground prison. T will get my revenge. I will make him pay. I will kill him, take away everything that was important to him. Adam will pay, said a voice that sounded deranged over and over again on a constant repeat. Laying off to the side of the cell was a bowl with small streaks of blood left behind from the inmates feeding. Not enough to be strong, but just enough to survive. He will pay. He will pay. He will pay. The inmates screamed out as the madness continued to take their mind from them with every passing second from the lack of blood and the pain of loss. T will make him pay, the voice said in a whisper, before finally going silent. Chapter 54. A Plan well, I'm on the run, or hiding at the moment. I know, who would have thought people from the Middle Ages would be smart enough to put the dots together? That me, a simple man, is the Adam from the Bible. Well, it started with people starting to stare at me more and more, which isn't something new, 
for as long as I can remember, since I came to this world, I have been stared at any time I'm in public. With my pale white flawless skin and silky smooth white hair, I have always been an oddity to people. Hell, my height alone sets me apart from the rest of the world. At over six feet tall, when everyone else alive is on average five six, I was virtually a giant in their eyes. But as to why I'm on the run, well, people seem to be angered at the fact that I ate from the forbidden tree and damned humanity to the world they live in. Which is total bullshit. If I was the real Adam, they shouldn't hold me totally responsible. Eve ate from it first. Sure, the Adam from the Bible fell to temptation and also ate from the tree, but if only she was banned from the garden, none of them would exist at all. So they should be grateful to uh, the fictitious Adam. That isn't me, or well as me, but morphed into a religion to explain the origin of mankind. Or maybe I just share the name with the real Adam. And this is all just one big misunderstanding, right? Well, anywho, after I got word from my bank head in England that people were starting to get suspicious of me, I decided to take a trip somewhere else for a generation or two while I wait for those that are suspicious of me to die so I could return back to England. Something I also learned from this whole thing is I needed to dye my hair for a while to hide from people a little more than I have been and hopefully buy myself some time while I come up with a plan of where I'm going to go. To dye my hair, I used ground up coal and honey to dye my hair. I would like to say it was a massive success and it worked perfectly. And while it did, sort of, the coal turned my hair a medium gray color and not the black I was going for, but it was acceptable. Now, not completely sticking out like a sore thumb, I had to figure out what I'm going to do for the next 80 grueling years. Lasked Jane and Julius if they wanted to come with me, but they said they were traveled out. How preposterous of them. I did it way longer than them, and I never got bored of it, although that might have something to do with my emotional dampeners, which dampen any feelings I might have, which would drive me nuts, like boredom or complete sadness. Eh. Who cares? It's been a while since I did something on my own anyway, I thought. So now I just need to decide what I'm to do. At the moment, I'm sitting on a wooden box in a dock in London, looking around the busy port. I watched as people came and went, kids, women, and men, all going about their daily travels, as I sat watching, and slowly kicked my feet back and forth on the box. Thankfully, they don't stare at me so much anymore with my new hair color, I thought with a rueful smile. Looking up at the squawk of a bird, I started to think again. What is happening in the world right now? I wondered. Better question, what isn't happening right now? You have Khan about to start his reign of conquest, the Fourth Crusade is about to happen, and most of the world is in a state of flourishment. I continued to think while I sat, hunched on the wooden box. Hmm, I haven't given being a soldier a try yet, and it would be cool to ride with the great Khan in his conquest. So why don't I do both? I thought as a smile slowly grew on my face. First, I would try soldiering in the Crusades first, since this round of it will start in 1202, and Genghis Khan will start his main advancement somewhere around 1209, so that will give me a few years to toddle around as a soldier, then I can ride with the Mongol hordes. Making my way to my bank in London, I slowly wandered to muddy streets filled with common folk. At the moment lawn, Don boasted a population of around 30,000 people. Not massive like some places like Rome, Hangzhou, Constantinople, and definitely not Baghdad, which had around one million people in that one city alone. But it was a respectable amount. Walking down the streets, I looked around at the homes that went up to three stories high. Lalways loved seeing those homes. They always reminded me of Diagon Alley from Harry Potter. With their crooked and leaning look to them, they, as well as the fact they were built to overhang the streets below, making them all the more dangerous and cool-looking. Finally, making my way to the bank, I stopped and stared at the opulent stone building. The bank was mostly made out of stone, with a clay roofing, which should protect it from any fire that will go up in this city in the next couple of years. The bank wasn't as pretty as some of my other banks in larger cities like Rome and Alexandria, but it did have its charms. The bank was about 90,000 square feet, 
and had five steps that led up to the large steel doors of the bank, which was guarded by eight heavily armed and armored men, and that's just by the door. I knew that on the inside were almost fifty other soldiers patrolling the bank's ground floor, while in the underground vaults there was a constant rotation of another thirty soldiers. The inside was lit by torches and candles, since there were no windows built into the structure, the main metal doors the only opening for air to enter. But the only reason the people on the inside could breathe was because I had them place metal tubes high up off the ground towards the rood, which allowed air to come in. Also had them do the same for the underground area, all because people in this time period couldn't figure out that there is no air underground. Entering the bank with my gold card in hand, I was shown to the current bank head. His name was Abel Gru and was a short, thin man that was currently in the final stages of hair loss. Stepping into his small office, Abel practically fell over himself to accommodate me, asking if I would like a drink or anything under the sun. No thank you, Abel. I just popped by to ask you to do some small things for me, I said to him. Oh, of course, what would you like for me to do for you, sir? I need you to get me a set of chain mail, a helmet, a horse, and a couple of people to carry all of my gear and to polish all of it, I said in one breath. Abel was wide-eyed at my words, as if I was God talking to a mere cow. But hey, I guess since he nodded his head, he got the message. Not wanting to stand here for the rest of the day while the man stared at me, I gave him a small smile and a wave, then headed out. Now I should have specified the limits of what I asked for. A set of chain mail, which is one set of mail like a shirt. A helmet, which is one helmet. A horse is a fucking horse. And people to carry and take care of all my gear should have been maybe one or two people. Not the small freckin' army I found a few days later waiting for my arrival. And I mean, no less than a hundred people. Oh, you've got to be kidding me, I thought as I looked at the mass of people. There were about 40 soldiers in full gear and about 60 servants that would follow behind us with carts full of supplies. Mentally smacking myself for being slow to the fact that my bank heads see me as a god and anything I say is gospel and to not follow my words is sacrilege. And in this point in time, sacrilege is a big no-no. So facing the music, I slowly made my way through the crowd of people and into the bank while trying to stay invisible. Sitting behind his desk was my good friend Abel, acting as if he did nothing wrong. Closing the door to his office, I turned to look at Abel with a raised eyebrow. Ah, sir, you arrived, he said in a cheerful voice. Yes, I did, I said in a dry tone. Not seeming to hear my tone, Abel continued. Well, sir, if you would follow me, I will show you to Captain Travis he will. I raised a hand to cut him off. Abel, the other day I meant only a peg, few people to follow me, not a small village. He looked at me confused. But sir, you asked for people to carry all of your supplies. He nodded my head. Yes, one or two people, not one hundred people. Abel raised his hands. Tam, sorry sir, I thought this is what you wanted. He said. I let out a sigh. Have they already been paid? I asked. He shook his head. Only half of what they would be getting, the rest they would be paid when all of you returned. He said. Right? Like any of them would be alive by the time I returned, I thought. Look, since they won't be leaving with me, just tell them they can keep what they have been paid, and to go home and look for other work, just pick two people to carry and take care of my gear, would you? I told him. He slowly nodded his head. Very well, sir. I will do as you ask, he said, and bustled out of the room. So with this chapter, I'm building up for the next one, which will be half of the MC being a knight, and the other half, him riding with the Mongols. Adam is going to have his hair dyed for a while, at least until people start to wear those wigs. And let me know if you saw the Adam Sandler movie reference. And please let me know if there are any issues with the chapter. Thanks a ton. Bean. Word. Late Hadrian 52. Chapter 55. Notice. Hey everyone, I just wanted to tell you I'm going to be taking a small break for a few day, to a week. But don't worry, I will return. I'm going to be making some extra chapters in advance, so I won't be rushing all of my chapters like I have been doing from the start. And it will also allow me to make a schedule for chapter releases, 
instead of me posting them as soon as I am done writing them on my hour lunch breaks. My plan is to make at least 10 advanced chapters to give me some breathing room and to not keep me stressing about releasing chapters. It will also let me write without making plot holes in the story, as well as allow me to make a better written story that isn't so jumbled. I have grown as a writer, and I am truly happy I chose to post this story here. Thank you all for your constant support and your patience. Chapter 56 In the Doghouse and Wolves Sitting in his reclining chair, Julius read a rather interesting passage from one of Adam's journals. It was a passage about his journey east, along the Silk Road, and how he started to learn the Asian language on the road. As he was reading, Jane came from their room, also holding one of Adam's old A. 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 Chapter 56 In the Doghouse and Wolves Sitting in his reclining chair, Julius read a rather interesting passage from one of Adam's journals. It was a passage about his journey east, along the Silk Road, and how he started to learn the Asian language on the road. As he was reading, Jane came from their room, also holding one of Adam's old and battered journals. Stopping in front of the fire, Jane turned to look at Julius. Do you think he actually did everything he's written about and seen all those wonderful things? She asked him. Julius lowered what he was reading and looked at her. T. Do, you should know, Adam isn't one for embellishment, and if anything, he understated most of his writings. Jane raised one of her perfect eyebrows. Really? She asked. Julius nodded his head. In fact, recently, I found out Adam has been hiding a few things from us, he said and shook his head. Jane slowly lowered the journal she had been holding. Like what? She asked him. Julius gnawed on his lip for a moment while deciding if it was a good idea to tell her. Do you know why Adam decided to leave for a little while? Julius asked her. Something about joining some holy army or something? Jane said with a shrug. He had three other opportunities to do that, but now, out of nowhere, he just decides to leave? Julius guided her to a conclusion. Maybe he just became curious? She said questioningly. Julius let out a sigh. He loved Jane with every inch of his heart, but Jane seemed to always be oblivious to things that should be right in front of her. Jane is smart, that there is no doubt, but she seems to look at the smaller picture, rather than the forest through the trees, but Julius was working on that with her. Have you read the Bible? Julius asked her. Jane gave another shrug. A little. Did you get to the part about the Garden of Eden? He asked. She nodded her head. And what were the names of the first humans? He again guided her. Instantly, Jane said, Toot was Eve and Ad. Jane came to a halt. The journal she had been holding slipped from her hands to flop onto the stone ground. Adam, she finished, wide-eyed and open-mouthed. Julius nodded his head. That's right, our Adam might be the first man created by God, he said. Jane, still in a state of shock, said, But, but, but. Julius raised his hands. To ask him about it, but he refused to confirm the fact. He said he wasn't the first human, but I have read and reread the Bible over and over, and the description of Adam from the Bible matches our Adam perfectly, making it hard for me to believe that he isn't the first human, Julius said. Continuing before Jane could speak, Julius said, But Adam did have a good rebuke, he said. A long time ago he was a well-known traveler that became something of a myth called the White-Haired Traveler and went from village to village all over the world, helping the sick as well as being a traitor. His journals can confirm that, so it is possible that his legend just got mixed into the Bible, Julius said. T. Suppose, but Adam also doesn't remember anything from before he woke in that forest, so it is possible, Jane said. Yes, that is true, but our Adam also doesn't have any marks on him, which the Adam from the Bible is said to have. Jane slowly nodded her head. T. Suppose. After a moment of silence, Jane's eyebrows furrowed. And how long exactly have you known about this? She asked Julius. Julius scratched the side of his head, not because of an itch, but out of habit. Well, about, um, about three hundred years, he said. Three hundred years, Jane shouted. Julius raised his hands as if to protect himself from Jane's oncoming vocal attack. You didn't say anything for three hundred years, she said angrily. Well, it didn't seem so important, so what if Adam is or isn't the first human? Tisn't important, Julius. What is important is that you said nothing for nearly three hundred years. Julius slowly lowered his hands and looked at Jane. 
Tim Khan Fu, said. He said. Well, you shouldn't be. We are going to be together for possibly the rest of eternity, Julius. We need to be open with each other, Jane said sternly. But Julius managed to get out before Jane stopped him with a raised hand. No buts, Julius. Uh, you men, she said before picking up the dropped journal and storming off while Julius sat in his chair, confused. Is this what Adam meant when he said women think differently than men, he wondered as he sat there. What really confused Julius was that she was angry about that and didn't even seem to care about the fact Adam could possibly be the first human to live, but instead that he didn't say anything to her about it. She should have gone with Adam, Julius thought. Looking into the roaring fire, in the fireplace, Julius spoke aloud. To wonder what he is doing at the moment. No, the other way, I said, as I showed John how to polish my helmet. At the moment we were about two days from Paris, where we would be massing for the crusade. Sitting around a small fire were myself, John, and Henry. The two of them reminded me of Murtaugh and Mulroy from Pirates of the Caribbean, if I wasn't in a separate universe altogether, I would have thought they were them. John looked just like the heavyset Mulroy, while Henry looked just like the skinny Murtaugh. And even more, they acted just like them. Yeah, you dimwit, the other way. Murtaugh, or Henry said to John, as he sharpened the prop sword I had bought. Turning to look at Henry, I said, Quiet you, and start sharpening that blade correctly instead of just moving the wet stone along the blade. How about you focus on your own task? I said to him. Now normally, I am slow to get annoyed, but these two have been bickering non-stop since they were assigned to me. The only reason I accepted them was because they looked like two of the characters from some of my favorite movies, which caused me to, at the time, overlook their annoying tendencies. Sitting back down on a log, I moved my feet towards the fire and let out a long sigh. I'm already tired of this journey, I thought. It had been a very long time since I had been to Northern Europe, like France, Germany, and all those countries, and instead focused on places like Rome, the Middle East, and Asia instead. Not out of a hate for these places, but that there was nothing here for me. As we sat in silence, with only the pops and crackling of the fire for noise, as well as the sounds of Henry and John finishing their tasks, I was finally able to let out a relaxed sign as the warmth of the fire washed over me. Crack! My eyes popped open at the sound of a large branch being broken from somewhere around us. Both John and Henry came to a complete halt as they too heard the sound. Turning to look in the direction of the sound, I looked into the inky blackness of the surrounding forest. With my eyes, I could see into the forest much better than any normal human could, but not as great as a vampire could. Vampires could see in total blackness, while I needed at least a little light to see, but unfortunately, the night sky was covering the full moon's light, with thick clouds, and the fire we sat by, only made it harder for me to see out, and into the darkness. Turning to look at John and Henry, I said, Henry, give me my sword, I am going to check out what that sound was. I said, as I put my hand out for my prop sword. I bought the prop sword for its simplicity. I didn't need a master-made blade now that I could use my aura ability to make even a dull blade sharper than anything on this planet, and besides I was going up against humans this time, not vampires. Lalso didn't bring my own sword this time, because of its uniqueness, which would draw some unwanted looks that I didn't need at the moment. Henry quickly handed over my long sword while nervously looking around the dark woods. Yes, sir. Here you are, he said while handing it over. As he was handing it over, my ears started to pick up the sound oh, uh, F leaves being stepped on, as well as some sticks being stepped on, and alarmingly, I could hear all of that, in all directions. We are surrounded, I thought. It must be bandits. But before I could do anything, a gust of wind blew through the camp, bringing Avery distinct smell with it. As the smell registered in my brain, a sound traveled from no less than a hundred feet from our camp, piercing my ears. How will? I turned in the direction of the howl and readied my blade, waiting to activate my aura. This can't be right. That was way too loud for a wolf, I thought. Turning my head to look at John and Henry, who were now sitting close to each other by the fire, I spoke. The both of you stay here and don't do anything stupid, I said before stepping into the dark forest. 
Word 1674. They have a schedule now. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and sometimes Sunday. Most of my chapters will be posted around 10 a.m. Ramaf, Central America time. This will be starting next week on the 22nd of January. Chapter 57. Werewolves or Demons Stepping into the woods, I was finally able to see into the forest with the bright light of the fire to my back. It gave me enough light to see deep into the thick woods. Hearing the sound of rustling undergrowth, I turned to see what was making the noise, and hoping it wasn't what I thought it was. Moving in a blurry streak, a brown-colored creature came straight for me. Not thinking of my actions, I activated my aura ability and sliced down on the creature as soon as it was close enough for the attack. My new longsword, which was nearly a foot longer than my own gladius sword, gave me the advantage of distancing myself from any attacker, as well as giving me a greater attack range without the need to move. And if this creature is what I think it is, the last thing I needed was to be bitten or possibly scratched. Yes, my system purged most of the vampiric venom from my body, but it still left a trait behind. Who knows what would happen if a werewolf was to do the same to me, and what trait could be left in me. But with my speed and strength, I should be able to hold off any number that was here. My sword sliced the beast in half, straight down the middle, splitting the beast in two. As the two halves of the beast separated, the momentum of its movement brought the two halves past me, where they hit the ground to my sides. Looking down at one of the halves to my right, I looked down at the creature I had just killed, and when I saw what it was, my stomach dropped. The beast was a mix between human and wolf, with a barrel chest and fur covering around 80% of it. Werewolf, I thought. The arms and legs looked to be stretched out and bent in inhumane ways, while its hands were elongated and starched out to clawed-tipped fingers. Using my foot, I rolled the corp over to get a look at one half of the face. As I did so, guts and bones sludged out of it to steam on the ground. Ignoring the disgusting insides, I looked the creature over. The face weirded me out to no end. It had a human-like eye that was wide open and looked to be a mix of light blue and a dark yellowish green, with an elongated mouth that lengthened and turned into that of a wolf, which seemed strange mixed with a human-like cheekbone structure. The face had patches of brown fur and pointed ears that had no hair and looked like they belonged to a goblin. Fuck was all my brain managed to get out, as I saw for the first time, something I didn't know existed. The movies never said anything about this, just shapeshifters in the Americas, not werewolves. I mumbled to myself as my eyebrows narrowed with concern. I did remember a few times in the movies, the Volturi mentioning werewolves, instead of shapeshifters, which the pack in the movie are. For so long I had yet to see any until now, so I had assumed that only the Quilute tribe existed, and were the only kind of supernatural beasts besides the vampires. The difference between werewolves and shapeshifters is that shapeshifters are born while werewolves are created, sort of like vampires are created. Both vampires and werewolves are created by a venom or virus that gets into their bloodstream and changing them at a genetic level. What can make them so dangerous is that werewolves turn into mindless animals that will kill anything breathing they can find during full moons and can't turn at will. While shapeshifters are fully in control of themselves while in their beast forms, turning my head, I could hear what sounded to me like a herd of animals heading straight for me. Bracing myself for what was more than likely the rest of the pack, I couldn't help but let out a mental sigh as the problems all of this would bring ran through my head. Now I have to deal with this. I was really looking forward to joining a crusade. Oh well, isn't there going to be more? or perhaps I can eradicate all of the werewolves before it even starts. I thought, as the first werewolf came into my sight. The last thing this world needs is for this to spread uncontrollably around the world. Vone Henry Both John and Henry sat glued to their seated spots as they watched the brilliant light show that was taking place in front of them. Bright purple light streamed through the thick forest, as the sounds of what they could only describe as a pack of wolves fighting and yelping. The noise echoed through the forest and into their camp, leaving both of them scared to their bones. What in heaven is that? John said, 
in fear and astonishment. To must be the work of the devil, Henry stammered out as his chest heaved in panic. Knew it must be some sort of light Sir Adam is using to see, John said as he watched the light. Henry looked over at him. He must be one of those witches or a soldier of the devil, Henry said with the fever of a true believer. We have been traveling with Sir Adam for a few weeks now, and I'm no slow-minded farmer. I have been to church every holy day, and I haven't seen any signs of him being either a witch or an agent of evil, because I, for one, haven't seen him eat a single baby or devour a soul. John shot back at Henry. Henry let out a gasp. He must have set a spell on you, he said, scooting away from John. But Henry only managed to scoot a little over a foot from John when something came crashing through the forest and into the middle of their camp. The sound brought them both to a halt, as the corb of a strange beast crashed down right where Henry had been seated. Both John and Henry sat in shock as they got a good look at what had just landed between them. Mm, mm, monster! John said in a panic as he used his hands to crawl back and away from the beast, while Henry himself did the same while shouting, It's the spawn of the devil! It's the spawn of the devil! John had backed up to the log Adam had been using before the monster attack, while Henry backed into the cart's wheel. T told you this was a bad idea, Henry shouted, pointing an accusing finger at John. Me, you can't do that. You agreed to come, even after I warned you that there would be danger on a crusade. John shot back. True, but I was expecting a human enemy. Not this, he shouted, gesturing at the core. All the while they argued, the battle continued in the surrounding forest, and the cart horse stood not far away, munching on some dry grass calmly and without a care in the world. My sword took off limbs and sliced through the small horde of werewolves that continued to attack me. Even after five minutes of continued slicing and chopping, the werewolves seemed to be unfazed at the destruction I was causing them, and the pile of their bodies I was leaving around me continued to grow. Like crazed beasts, they continued to attack me, but like the rest of their friends, they only got within the range of my sword before they were killed with a blow of my blade. What surprised me was the strength and speed these werewolves possessed. If I had to say, they could be on part with the average vampire that is out of their newborn phase. They had the speed to be a blurry motion while running, and from the speed and sound their clawed hands made, when I dodged them, I could tell there was some serious strength behind their hits. Blocking a particularly feral swing, I chopped off the limb and then the head of the beast. Just like the battle with the vampires, I lost myself in the fight. I didn't want to use my shockwave at the moment, because there wasn't much of a need. At the moment, I was cutting them down with almost complete ease and didn't find the use of it necessary and just a waste. In a blur, I continued to slice and chop the werewolves into pieces, like a blender. After a few more minutes, the once steady stream of wolves slowed down a bit until no more were adding to the fight, and I was able to finish off the last remaining werewolves. Breathing a little harder than normal from my exertions, I looked around and was a bit amazed. In sliced pieces and decapitated corpses, the bodies of no less tea, and three hundred werewolves, scattered the woods. A few of the trees had large chunks of bark and wood missing from when I threw a wolf or two into them, and the ground was soggy from the large amounts of blood that I had just spilt. Just then, the clouds began to clear a bit and let a stream of the moon's light to stream down and light the forest with its glow. What the fuck? I let out with a sigh. I need to figure out where this is coming from. I thought as I looked down at the wolf I had stepped on. Author's Notes So the MC will still become a crusader, but first he will need to track down where the werewolves are coming from and who or what is turning people. Unfortunately, he won't become a Mongol, though. Something is going to pop up that will keep him away from doing that and keep him from destroying the Mongols for some of the things they had done. By the time he becomes a crusader, it will be when they are leaving on ships to sack Constantinople. I have a good idea for the sacking of Constantinople, where the MC will do something to spread his legend, and maybe a little extra. Werewolves will be eradicated, partly by the MC and the other part by the Volturi. 
I will do a chapter in the Volturi's POV about their run-ins with werewolves, which will start their hate for them, and by connection, the shapeshifters, that will be in forks. Interestingly, the moon-touched werewolves are as fast and slightly stronger than a regular vampire, but not on the same level as a newborn. Even so, they are still a real threat to the vampire and human worlds. They are also smaller than a shapeshifter's wolf form, who are on average twice the size of werewolves, but can still hold their own against either shapeshifters or vampires. This should show how much stronger the MC is compared to the rest of the vampiric and supernatural world. But don't worry, I know he is super OP, but I already have an endgame enemy who will be on par with the MC, and something or more like someone I think will surprise all of you. Word 1946 Please let me know if there are any issues with the chapter. Lamb trying to do some different POVs mixed into the story, or as chapters. Let me know what you think about that. Chapter 58. Attempted Explanation and a Battle of Wit I broke from my thoughts as the sounds of panicked voices came from behind me, where I had forgotten about my two very human and completely normal companions who were still in the camp. Fuck, I thought, as I remembered their presence. Slowly making my way back to the camp, I started to think of things to say to them that might explain to them what just happened. Stepping into the small opening and into the camp's firelight, my presence became known to both John and Henry at the same time. Both of them were in the middle of a rather loud argument when my blood-covered figure emerged from the dark forest surrounding them. Henry and John both turned to face me and promptly lost their minds. Henry screamed as he backed away from me, but ended up bumping into the also-screaming John, who was standing behind him, causing them to fall to the ground. Don't eat our souls! John cried out as he covered his face and head with his arms, while Henry used both of his pointer fingers to make a cross as he prayed loudly. The cacophony of noise they made made me wince at their raised and panicked voices. Looking to the side of the camp, I saw the cart horse munching away at some dry grass. Getting tired of the noise coming from the two, I shouted, Will the both of you shut your air holes? Both of them went dead silent as they looked at me. I raised my hand to stop Henry from speaking. Shh, not a word, I said. Shutting his mouth again, I waited to see if either would try and speak again. When neither did, I let out a sigh. At least let me clean up before the both of you start asking questions. I said, walking past them and to my previously seated spot. Stepping over the dead body of a werewolf, I sat back down on my log and started taking off my tunic and other bloody clothes. It took me about ten minutes before I was charged and cleaned up, using water from our water skins to clean myself. Now, seated by the fire in some clean clothes, I looked over the fire where both John and Henry had seated themselves right next to each other, neither of them looking away from me. Raising my hands, I said, Ask away. While I had been changing into some new clothes, I had decided to just tell them part of the truth, because my brain was completely blank when I tried to think up an excuse for what had happened and figured if they were to tell others, they wouldn't be believed. Are you a soldier of the devil? Henry asked first. I shook my head. No, I'm not, I said. Are you a witch? John asked. No, and the male term is wizard. Witches are female, while wizards are male. I said. They both let out gasps. Only a witch would know that, Henry said with fear. I looked at him. Tam not a witch, I am human, just like you, I said. Lear, you be a demon from the fires of hell, sent to destroy us and eat all of our souls. Henry said. Ismacked my forehead and let out a sigh. Look, the both of you dimwits, I am not a demon, I am a human. With abilities. What did you just call us? John said, angered. You heard my words, and if you two don't... Oh, what's the point? The both of you don't even have a single brain cell between the both of you to make a sandwich. I said in irritation. Is that a slur? John said as he stood to his feet, with Henry hot on his heels to follow his lead. Because I'll let you know, I've been in a few dust-ups in my time, and I haven't lost a one, but if you slur our mums again, we can have a go. John said, raising his fists, ready to fight. Yeah, don't slur our mums. Henry added, at John's side, also raising his fists for a fight. I couldn't help but let out a raucous laugh. The two of them looked like children getting ready for a schoolyard brawl. 
Both of them had their thumbs in their palms, with the rest of their fingers covering them to make fists, and the clear fear in their eyes only made it funnier. Either these two really don't have a brain cell between them, or they have big or gonads than brains. I thought, as I brought my laughter under control. I don't laugh. Your life be on the end of a tether here and now, Henry said, as he moved his fist in a circle. Again I let out a laugh, but while I wiped a tear from the corner of my eye, I slowly stood up and looked at them. T meant no disrespect, I told them. Both John and Henry looked at each other, then back at me. Really? Henry said in confusion. He nodded my head. Really? At my words, they slowly lowered their hands. Good, John said with a sniff while he crossed his arms over his chest. He let a small smile spread across my face at his words. Now let me put this in a way both of you can understand. Mayhaps God fashioned thee both with the wit of turnips and the visages of mangy curs. Both John and Henry looked to be shell-shocked. What? John shouted with anger as he rolled up his sleeves ready for a fight. Wait, John, Henry said, grabbing a hold of John's arm. Once John had stopped, Henry turned to look at me, then taking a wired pose with one leg bent and one hand under his chin, he said, Thy mind is as dull as a worn-out plow, unable to cultivate a single intelligent thought, but thou be, be, ah. Uh. Again, I couldn't hold back my laughter at Henry's failed attempt. You flee, you forgot how it went. John whispered into Henry's ear. Turning to face John, Henry whispered back. He couldn't help it, it was too long to remember. John grabbed Henry by his tunic's collar and said, But we've been practicing for nearly a full moon, how could you forget? He angrily asked Henry. Like I said, it's too long to remember, and if you wish to belittle me, the least you can do is tell me how it's supposed to go. Henry shot back. It's supposed to go, uh, it's supposed to go like... John said, as he looked up in thought. Henry pointed his finger at John. You have also forgotten. He said angrily at John. Have not, he said back. Have to. Have not. Have to. Have not. John said this time pushing Henry back a step. Have to. Henry said, pushing John back twice as hard. You little, rotten little. John stammered as he rushed Henry, tackling him to the ground, all throughout their whispered argument, to their shoving match and now fight. Thad been listening and laughing like a madman at them off to the side. Watching them roll around on the ground, I couldn't help but fall over laughing. The two of them were just like little kids. The way they argued, all the way to how they fought each other, I couldn't help but laugh at them. After a minute of rolling on the ground, I finally managed, with a great amount of willpower, to get my laughter under control. Sitting up, I wiped the streams of tears away with the sleeves of my tunic before standing up again. By this point, both John and Henry weren't even fighting anymore, but were instead just laying on the ground, breathing hard, and throwing insults at each other. All right, all right, that's enough. We have gone way beyond topic, I said as I sat back on the fallen log. Slowly and with a bit of difficulty, John and Henry sat up and made their way back to the fire, where they both plopped back down, both of them still breathing hard. Right, where were we? I asked myself. Witches, John said as he pulled some grass from his hair. Right, I said, snapping my fingers. Like I had been saying before, I am not a witch nor a wizard, I am human, with a few abilities. Neither John nor Henry said anything, and instead stayed silent at my words, both too exhausted from their three-minute brawl. Very good, any questions? I asked. What abilities do you have? Henry asked. Good question. Well, I'm stronger and faster than ten men, I said proudly. Both John and Henry looked at me with unbelieving eyes. Sure. I shrugged my shoulders and stood. Going to the cart, I picked up from the back an axe with a metal top. Going back to my seat, I handed it to them. Is the axe head metal? I asked. Both of them looked at, and the plate D then tested the axe, making sure it was real. After a few moments, they handed it back. It's real, Henry said. Good, I said simply, before grabbing the top with both hands and twisted. The axe head turned, as if it was rubber in my grip, before it broke in two. Both John and Henry stared wide-eyed and open-mouthed at what I had just done. My goodness, John said in amazement. After a moment of silence, John asked, If you are a regular man like us, then how did you get your abilities? He asked with a raised eyebrow. This is where I was going to use their faith against them. With a wide smile, I said, God. Both of their eyes went wide. God! 
Both John and Henry wide-eyed said in unison. He nodded my head. That's right, I said with a smile. Henry leaned over to John and whispered into his ear. Don't listen to him. It's all lies. He must be a demon from hell sent to test our faith. As long as we stay true, God will protect us. He said, nodding his head. I couldn't help but smack my forehead again. This is going to be a long night, I thought, before speaking again, and just decided to use the biggest card I had. Tam, the Adam card. Another chapter down word, 1868. If there are any issues with the chapter, please let me know. This chapter shows how dim-witted both John and Henry can be, but to be fair, most people of the time would probably act the same in their circumstances, minus the whole word bit. That just shows how goofy they can be, and acts as a kind of character development for the two in later chapters. Of course they will only be in this miny arc, but who knows, they might reappear in another adventure down the road. In the next chapter, the MC is going to start the hunt, so stay tuned for the next chapter. Chapter 59, a quick lesson then reveal. Okay, look, I have some questions to ask, I said. John, you said you went to church every holy day, correct? I asked him. He nodded his head. We both did, he said, pointing his thumb at himself, then Henry. Good, I said, standing up. So the both of you know a good bit of the Bible, I asked. Both of them nodded. And so the both of you know how mankind came to be on earth, I asked. Yes, we do, Henry said. Then you know of Genesis, I asked. The creation of earth, heaven, hell, Adam and Eve, I continued. Of course we do, just like any God-fearing man on his earth should, Henry said, while straightening his back proudly. He nodded my head, and bent down to grab a burning piece of wood from the edge of the fire. And what does Genesis tell you about Adam and Eve? I asked while waving the piece of wood through the air, and allowing some embers to fly off into the air. Well, it says, Adam was created from the dust of earth, to be in the image of God, then have life breathed into him. John said, leaning back on his hands, Correct. I said, pointing the still burning stick at John. Turning it to point at Henry, I asked, And what of Eve? She was created from one of Adam's ribs, when God saw that Adam needed a companion. Very good, I said, putting the stick partially back into the fire. The reason I was asking them all of these questions was because if I was to just come out and say, Yeah, you know that guy you currently think helped doom you to your miserable life here on earth, when you could be in Eden without any fears, yup, that's me, Adam, the Adam. They either wouldn't believe a word I said, or would hate me and run away, which wouldn't be the worst thing that could happen. But what can I say? I've become attached to the two morons. They just had this way of being annoyingly funny. But my plan now is to paint my alter ego, Adam, in a better light and correct them in their thinking. Because just like back in London, they believed Adam and Eve are the sole reason for being kicked from Eden, and the serpent that convinced them takes the back seat in their thoughts to be forgotten, even though it is the serpent which caused all of it. Thankfully, I only need to convince two people and not a city. And why did Adam and Eve get banished from Eden, I asked. Oh, I know this one, John said excitedly. They ate from the tree of knowledge, disobeying God's command and condemning man. He nodded my head. So do you blame them for doing so? I asked. Of course we do, Henry said in an angry voice. Oh, really? And why did they eat from the tree when they clearly knew not to? Tasked them. Both of them went silent, clearly thinking hard. I waited for a moment, but they were clearly having trouble. To let out a small sight. The serpent, I said. Ah, that's right, Henry said, wagging a finger in the air. And what did the serpent do? I asked them. It told Eve to eat from the tree, John said in a self-assured manner. And I said, waving my hand for him to continue. And what? He asked. Oh, so you think the serpent just said, Hey, do you see that tree over there? The one God said not to eat from. You should go and eat from it. And Eve just said, Okay. And went to eat from the tree? I asked them. Both of them stared at me. Well, yeah, Henry said with furrowed brows. I shook my head at his words. Who was the serpent? I asked. The devil, John asked in a questioning tone. That's correct, I said. The master of all that is evil, deceptive, deceitful, a liar. Do you think he told the truth when he told Eve to eat from the tree of knowledge? I asked. No, both John and Henry said in unison. That's right. No, he didn't. The serpent who is the devil, 
engaged Eve in a conversation, questioning and distorting God's command not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The serpent deceived Eve into believing that eating from the tree would not lead to death, but would make her like God, knowing good and evil. I, said, both John and Henry took on contemplative looks as they thought on my words. So it's not Eve's or Adam's fault for eating from the tree, John said, while rubbing his scruffy chin. Correct, they were misled into believing it wasn't bad for them to do so. One said, they nodded their heads. Why do you bring all of this up? Henry asked, confused. I raised my hand. I'm getting to that, I said. Leaning back down, I grabbed the stick I had placed back into the fire and took it out. Now what happened once Adam and Eve were banished from Eden? I asked. Well, Adam worked the land while Eve had to bear children, John said. Correct. Then what? I asked, really starting to get into my teacher mode. Well, Adam worked the land while Eve had two sons, Henry said. Would you look at that? The two of you are smarter than I was giving you credit for, I said jokingly. Before either could get angry, I continued. And what happened to the two sons, Cain and Abel? I asked. They worked the land with their father Adam, John said. Yes, but what happened to them? I asked. Oh, Cain killed his brother in a fit of jealousy, becoming the first to kill another human, Henry said. That's right, I said. But Adam, their father saw this happen, and in a rage, killed Cain, becoming the second to do so, Henry added. And who also saw this happen? God, he saw it happen, John said. And what did he do to Adam? He cursed Adam with immortality and to be a wanderer. Henry said, Do you think Adam deserved it? I asked them. Both of them took on looks of thought. T don't, John said. A few moments later, so did Henry. Neither do I, he said. Asmal's smile appeared on my face. And why is that? I asked. Well, if I had been in his place, I might have done the same, Henry said. T as well, John added. Very good, so they don't mind what Adam did to his other son. It was the whole eating from the tree of knowledge and being banished from Eden that held them back from accepting that neither Adam or Eve are bad. I thought, as the small smile on my smile slowly grew, waving the burning stick around again, my eyes followed the small flames that burned the top half of the stick. What do the two of you think he is doing now? I asked. Just what God cursed him to do, wander. John said with a shrug, let out a chuckle. Yes, I think so too, never able to stay in one place for long before becoming unsatisfied and bored, before a need to wander starts to take hold, and a need to move takes over. I said, looking down at John and Henry, I saw that they were both looking at me confused. That's why I brought all of this up, I said. Both John and Henry looked at each other. Um, I'm lost, John said, raising an eyebrow. The reason I brought all of that up is because, well, I said, breaking off. Here goes nothing. I thought. Tam the Adam from the Bible. I said, dropping the stick to the ground and reaching my whole hand back into the fire and grabbing one of the logs that was bright red. The flames burned into my flesh and made a steaming, sizzling sound as my flesh was burned when I grabbed onto the large log. The pain was intense and hurt like hell, but was gone as soon as it came, my flesh healing faster than I was being burned and instead of pure pain, it only felt like the prickly feeling you get when a limb has fallen asleep. Looking at both John and Henry, I saw they watched my actions with bewildered and shocked looks. Waiting a moment to let what I had just done sink into their minds, I removed my hand from the red, burning fire and raised the log in my hand up for both of them to see. Sorry about the late post. Work was crazy yesterday and I forgot to set this chapter to auto-post itself. If there are any problems with the chapter, please let me know. Word 527. There is a reason why they need to know the MC is Adam for later chapters. Chapter 60. So this is out of my own curiosity, as well as a need for your input for my next fanfic. Currently I'm still writing this fanfiction full time and won't fully start another fic until this one is done. But I would like to ask what you would like as my next fanfiction. Asking now, will give me time to look into and plan what the next story will be about. Here is a small list of some of the ones I strongly suggest as a choice. I won't write anime, I couldn't give those shows the writing they deserve, and I'm 99.9% .9 sure I couldn't do it properly, so I will stick to shows or video games. Red Dead Redemption 2 through 1. Lucifer. Ragnarok. 
Netflix show, really hoping this one so I could give it an ending it truly deserves. Assassin's Creed, Unknown Witch, Hunger Games, Movie, 1 through 4, The Good Doctor, Peaky Blinders, Show, The Sopranos, Show, Kingsman Mafia, Game Unknown Witch, Sherlock, Movie of Show Your Choice, The Ridiculous Six, The Dirt, Movie Music, Sex ED, Netflix Show, Star Wars, The Force Awakens, Already Have an Idea for This One, Harry Potter, We'll Add More at a Later Time, Other, I would like to do one that has been done before on this site, instead on the same thing reused over and over again, because after a while they all seem to be the same. If you have any ideas, share with me, and I will add it to the list if it resonates with me. 1100% will finish the Twilight fic and won't rush it. This is just to give a good heads up for what I might write next.